Much of the open ocean is referred to as a biological desert. The vast majority of the sea is hundreds or thousands of kilometers from land, and is mostly empty water, poor in nutrients, and therefore containing little diversity in life forms. The parts of the sea we know and love, the coral reefs full of schools of colorful fish, or the channels between islands where dolphins and whales and sea turtles all spend time, make up just a tiny percentage of the ocean. For a long time, the only thing we were certain populated the open ocean in huge numbers was something of our own making. Plastic. Sometimes these garbage debris fields are so concentrated that they get their own names like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Garbage vortexes like this are a nasty testament to the state of our modern world, and we can't help but think of them with sadness and disgust, and a desire for somebody to scoop it all up. But the way we think about ocean garbage patches may actually be kind of wrong. I know when I first heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, I pictured a dense, singular, floating barge of trash. But really, the metric F-load of trash that's out there is more like a smattering of individual garbage pieces over a large area. And much to everyone's surprise, scientists have discovered that ocean garbage patches are not at all devoid of life. It turns out that an entire class of organisms lives their entire lives among the trash, and in great numbers. And these creatures look nothing like almost any other animal. Forget fins and tails and glittering scales. These jellyfish, snails, barnacles, hydrozoans, and nudibranchs belong to a class of their own, with fantastic and beautiful adaptations to their environment. These floating organisms live on the surface of the water and go wherever the wind and ocean currents take them. They come in dazzling shades of blue and purple, helping them blend into the surface of the water. And each has its own special trick for surviving their unique environment. An environment which is a thin sliver of water and air that's only about one meter in thickness. All of these organisms live right alongside the plastic collected in gyres by the very same forces that sweep our trash into certain parts of the ocean. Which means whenever we try to collect all that trash, we're also inadvertently sweeping away and killing hundreds or even thousands of unique organisms. So what are we supposed to do? Is there a way to clean up the ocean without killing all of these incredible life forms? Or do we simply just leave all that trash? How important to the health of the overall ocean are these colorful floating creatures? And what other mysteries might they still hold? Even under the calmest conditions, oceans are never completely still. Ocean gyres are a perfect example of this. There are five major gyres found across the planet, in the North and South Pacific, North and South Atlantic, and in the Indian Ocean. They're created by the spinning rotation of the planet, the blowing wind, and the placement of land masses. And there are plenty of smaller gyres all over the oceans too. The Sargasso Sea is located in the Atlantic, but has its own ecosystem and own boundaries defined by winds and currents. It's also filled with sargassum, an algae that experiences its entire life on the ocean surface rather than needing to reproduce attached to the sea floor. That algae is a hugely important habitat for numerous species, from sea turtles to eels. But the largest gyre of all is the North Pacific Subtropical Gyre, and it couldn't be more different from the Sargasso Sea. For a long time, it was thought to be largely devoid of life being so far from the coastline. But in the 1950s, a Soviet research vessel crisscrossed the Pacific, taking samples along the way, and discovered something astonishing. The surface of the ocean was filled with life, creatures that floated and bobbed, letting the wind and waves take them everywhere. These organisms were named Neustin, a word that plays on plankton combined with the Greek neustos for swimming. Some neustonic life forms only come to the surface for certain stages of their life cycle, like fish larvae, 
but obligate Newston spend their whole lives in the thin space between sea and sky. They're moved by the same forces that shape the ocean gyres. But since the 1950s, there's also been a new element added to the mix, plastic. Annual plastic production is close to 400 million metric tons, and each year, several million tons of that plastic enters the ocean. A lot of that trash gets caught around the coastlines or in rivers, but the pieces that do get swept out to the open ocean are usually buoyant, and become subject to the same forces that move the neustonic creatures around. Which means that where there are these organisms, there's probably also trash. Yet, trying to study these life forms and figuring out just how much plastic has made it into the gyre is extremely difficult logistically. The Pacific Ocean is enormous, and boats have to travel slowly to collect samples. There's just a lot we don't know yet. What we do know is that these life forms are incredibly strange and unique. One of the most iconic members of the Neuston family is the siphonophore Physalia physalis, more commonly known as the Portuguese Man o' War. They're infamous for their incredibly painful sting, which in rare cases can cause cardiac arrest. Though it may appear similar to a jellyfish, the Man o' War is actually a colonial hydrozoan. While it looks like a single organism, it's made up of individuals who serve specific purposes and work together as a collective unit. For Physalia, those main units are the pneumatophore, an air sac filled with oxygen and carbon dioxide that acts as a sail, the tentacle polyp used to sting and capture prey, the feeding polyp that digests food, and the reproductive structure. And although it has to rely on the motion of wind and water to transport it from place to place, the Portuguese man-o-war is still a formidable hunter. Its stinging tentacles can extend multiple meters below the sea, and it feasts on fish that swim into those tentacles and get stung to death. But just because it has some good strategies for catching mobile prey doesn't mean Physalia is safe from other predators. In fact, it's the favored food of a species so bizarre it barely looks real, a nudibranch known as the Blue Sea Dragon. Glaucus atlanticus and its relatives might look like harmless and dazzling little sea slugs, but they're actually armed with an incredible weapon, stingers that they steal from the Portuguese man-o-war. Rebecca Helm, an environmental scientist who specializes in neustonic lifeforms, has had first-hand experience with blue sea dragons and says they need to be handled with care. In general, on a large scale, they'll eat a tentacle. And within the tentacle, there are special cells that are shaped like eggs that contain the hypodermic needle that the man o war uses to deliver venom. So when they eat a tentacle, they have to somehow, right, like dig out these stinging cells, like digging out a cherry pit. And then in their gut, there are branches all the way up to the surface of their skin. And so each little cell gets redirected in their digestive tract up to their skin, unfired still, somehow, somehow. And we really have no idea because you can fire those tentacles with the briefest touch and somehow they're able to move them through their digestive tract up to the surface of their skin through these really cool canals, um, unfired, just waiting there for someone, usually <laughs> you know, a scientist or a curious person, to touch them and then that's it. But the blue sea dragon doesn't have any method of moving itself either. Its ability to float comes from the bubble of air that it swallows and holds in its stomach. Instead of seeking out prey, it has to wait for the ocean currents to bring it in direct contact with the hydrozoan. And then it employs another trick. They're called serrata, but they look like hands and they're coming off the side of their body and they actually use them like little hands to grab things. And it's so neat to see them, you know, interact with their environment and try to catch food. And, and they truly can't swim. They have no control over where they go and what they do. So they just kind of relax and sit in the sun. And when something bumps into them, it's like they're so fast. Their tail is prehensile, so they can wrap onto things with their tail and sort of hold on to multiple things at once and just kind of eat them one at a time. 
They're really, really cool. But the blue sea dragon isn't the only creature that eats Portuguese man o wars. So do the violet snails, Janthina Janthina, which also can't swim. These snails have to create bubble rafts from their own mucus just to stay afloat, and must be extremely careful when they're consuming prey. If the violet snails eat too much of their prey and don't have a stable raft of bubbles, both prey and predator will sink. The ability to stay afloat and be carried by wind and waves is critical for these strange organisms. Just as the Portuguese man o war relies on its pneumatophore to stay on the ocean's surface, a hydrozoan called Valella Valella, aka the By the Wind Sailor, has a dorsal fin protruding from its body to help it catch the breeze. But sometimes that little sail can backfire. These organisms are regularly seen on coastlines around the world after mass stranding events. When the wind switches to blowing towards the shore, hundreds and even thousands of these cnidarians can end up on the beach. And the problem might be getting worse for them as water temperature warms, even in winter. Dangerous as plastic is for many marine species, you know, at the end of the day, the biggest threat to marine life, no matter where you go in the ocean, is, is our changing climate and the unpredictability of that. And, and organisms that live at the surface, they're right there. They are the front line um, for the ocean. Everything that happens in the ocean has to go through the surface of the ocean. And so temperature changes, changes in weather patterns, they're going to experience it before any other creatures in the sea. And the harm of these man-made problems can be strange and unpredictable. For example, floating plastic doesn't just enter their environment and make a mess. Sometimes it also brings unexpected visitors. Historically, a very small number of organisms could travel large distances over the oceans on driftwood, colonizing new islands or even continents. But it was rare because driftwood decays pretty rapidly. But today, plastic presents an optimal floating surface, and organisms that were previously limited to shorelines are now traveling out to the open ocean and doing well enough that they can reproduce and establish permanent colonies floating out at sea. One major example of this was when the massive tsunami that hit eastern Japan in 2011 resulted in 4.5 million tons of debris getting washed out to sea almost instantly. By 2017, more than 100,000 pieces of debris from that tsunami had landed in North America, and 381 Japanese coastal species came with it, still alive. These were mainly little invertebrates, things like mussels, arthropods, cnidarians, and bryozoans. So it's not like Japanese macaques were riding the plastic trash all the way from their home to the Hawaiian Islands. But the fact that some of these organisms managed to survive a very long trip over open ocean and in some cases went through a reproductive cycle in an environment far different from their own suggests that they may be able to establish new populations at sea. And that could have unexpected consequences. Are they invasive species that will hurt the Neustin? Will they reshape the food webs in unexpected ways? Will they help clean up the plastic by digesting it? Scientists just don't know. It's the same with neustonic life forms, says Dr. Helm. So there are some species that seem to do better in the presence of plastic. And for a long time, this really confused me. I, I knew why they were laying their eggs on plastic and they needed something hard to lay their eggs on and, and plastic just happened to be it. But I couldn't figure out if this was a new thing and they were having this like amazing boom or if this was a comeback and they were laying their eggs on something else. But an amazing paper came out a couple years ago that showed the amount of natural debris, things like large pieces of wood that has, is entering the ocean is, is a fraction of what it used to be. I mean, it may be down by over 99%. So they're using this plastic perhaps in part because there's no longer much wood out there. So it's hard to know if these animals are negatively impacted by plastics, if plastics may be a, an imperfect and really kind of sad substitute for something that used to be there, or if they're sort of adjusting to something new. 
or if, if plastics may be harmful in some ways, and we just don't know. So this brings up the obvious question, should we clean it up or not? This is hard to answer in part because we don't even know how much garbage is really out there. It's estimated that by 2050, somewhere between 155 and 265 million metric tons of garbage will have entered the ocean. But at this point in time, scientists have only ever found hundreds of thousands of metric tons in the ocean. That amount accounts for less than 1% of all the plastic ever thought to have entered the ocean. So where is the 99% of the missing plastic? Scientists believe much of it gets degraded into microplastics, which get mixed into the sea floor or make their way into the bodies of ocean organisms. Other trash sinks to the deepest parts of the sea. Scientists know that the largest concentrations of garbage are found in gyres, but even these concentrations are nothing like what most people picture. The gyres cover a huge area, and the trash is very dispersed, says Dr. Helm. It's not this floating patch of trash that you can see from space. Nothing like that at all. In fact, if you were on a boat looking out at the garbage patch, it looks like beautiful, pristine ocean. It's only when you look more closely that you realize something's a little bit unusual about this particular spot. So it's not a singular dense barge of trash, but what is out there can still cause great harm to ocean life. One of the biggest problems are lost or discarded fishing gear called ghost nets that continue to do what they do best, trap and tangle wildlife, like sharks, whales, and turtles that may be passing through. There's also a risk that the degrading plastic will release chemicals into the water and hurt the animals. But any effort to clean up the plastic with huge, scooping nets will also endanger Neustonic life. Because researchers have found that the highest density of animals is positively correlated with the highest density of plastic debris. And if Neustonic species are killed in large numbers, it could have an impact on the turtles, fish, seabirds, and other animals that eat them. Plus, plastic might even be helping some species that lay their eggs on the plastic. So if scooping the plastic out of the ocean is a risk to sea creatures, what do we do instead? So I have some colleagues that think we should just leave it because it's already in the environment. And they have a good point that when you throw something away, you kind of give up ownership of it, right? I mean, that's the whole point. And if there are other creatures living on it, which is true for almost all plastic in the ocean, there's usually something that's turned it into a home. Um, you know, who are you to go in and take it back out? I, I tend to see things uh, as a little bit more, um, more about getting the most dangerous forms of plastic out in the safest possible way. So I'm a big fan of efforts to clean up large plastic debris, things like fishing gear that's been lost, which makes up the vast majority of plastic in the North Pacific garbage patch by weight. So these huge fishing nets, I mean, they can weigh over a ton and they are designed to catch and kill marine life. And they're designed to stay in the ocean for long periods of time without degrading. And so they're really dangerous to a lot of animals in the ecosystem. And they're actually really effective ways to remove ghost gear that don't involve yet more net. Some organizations will give GPS trackers to sailors so that they can tag large pieces of debris when they come across them. And then all those tagged bits of trash can be collected later. Another possibility could be using certain species of bacteria that actually eat and digest plastic. In fact, those bacteria might be one explanation for all the missing plastic in the ocean. Still, we probably shouldn't flood the open ocean with tons of new bacteria in hopes that they'll take care of our garbage. We need to find some way to get all that trash out, but we have to take into consideration which organisms we might be hurting when we do so. It's commendable what initiatives like the Ocean Cleanup Project are trying to do, using huge nets to scoop out tons of plastic from the garbage patch. And they say they're aware of the potential harm to ocean life and that they've adapted their design of its plastic catcher to allow species to swim away. But that's just the problem. Many Neustin can't swim away. 
and they've started scooping the plastic before studies have shown that there is no impact on the Newston. Many scientists simply wish for them to slow down and wait for more data to guide any massive cleanup effort. The Ocean Cleanup's other projects, like the river interceptors, are likely to be much more important in the future of the ocean anyway, preventing much of the trash from flowing out of the most polluting rivers in the first place. Before the development of plastics, Newston might have been one of the types of life that were least impacted by human activity, because they're just so remote. That's not the case anymore, and we still don't know how fragile their habitats are. The solutions aren't as easy as just collecting the trash, but maybe by studying the creatures who live amongst it, we'll better understand how to help them and clean up our mess at the same time. Our relationship with the ocean is an endlessly complicated one. And while nudibranchs may never be able to take revenge on us for messing with their habitat, some of their ocean brethren already are, as we talked about in our last video. Orcas seem to be letting us know that they are tired of our nonsense by ripping boats apart in the North Atlantic. It feels like our relationship with these creatures, and perhaps all ocean creatures, is reaching a crisis point. But it doesn't have to be this way, and it certainly wasn't always this way. And in fact, at one point in history, in one specific place, orcas and humans weren't at odds with each other, but rather were allies, friends, and even business partners. The orcas of Eden worked alongside humans for decades to hunt baleen whales off the coast of Australia, in the most incredible example ever recorded of orca-human cooperation. The combined forces of the world's top two apex predators was insurmountable, and dozens of the world's biggest animals were taken down every year. What could compel two apex predators from totally different environments to work together to achieve a common goal? How did they communicate, and how did they each keep up their end of the deal? This story of the Orcas of Eden is so incredible that I made another full-length video about it that you can watch now on Nebula. Here's a quick preview. Once the bloody hunt was complete, the men would leave the carcass anchored in place and let the orcas have the first go. The orcas ate the lips and tongue of the baleen whales, then the humans returned to harvest the rest of the body for its oil. This exchange was known as the Law of the Tongue, and it continued for decades, through multiple generations of the Davidson family. Among the most famous and recognizable of the orca partners was a large male known as Old Tom. His help was so invaluable that at one point when George Davidson was knocked out of a boat during a hunt, Tom circled him in the water, protecting him from sharks, until he was retrieved by the other humans. But sadly, the partnership was doomed to meet an untimely end. Nebula is a streaming platform that we built for exactly this reason. To explore topics more deeply, sometimes in new formats, and sometimes within subject areas that don't exactly fit our main YouTube channel. This video about the Orcas of Eden mixes history with science, but it's a topic I simply could not resist making a video about. Nebula allows me to take risks like this and experiment more. Whether it's this historical orca video, or the Nebula original series I made called Becoming Human, about the incredible story of how we came to understand human evolution. Nebula is a place for all of its creators to make experimental and new content, like Joe Scott's Mysteries of the Human Body, which takes you through some of the most baffling diseases and epidemics from history or Wendover Productions' Extremities, which shows you why and how people live in Earth's most isolated and extreme settlements. Nebula has even produced a feature-length film called Night of the Coconut, and a genre-bending, award-winning play called The Prince, which you can watch in its entirety on Nebula. You can also watch our next video now on Nebula, about the biggest tornadoes in history two weeks earlier than you can see it on YouTube. And now, if you sign up with the link below, subscribers also get access to classes. You can watch dozens of in-depth classes of creators teaching you how to create. So if you sign up using the link below, you can support this channel directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off the annual plan, 
for just $30 for the entire year. At the second conference of the Hydrozoan Society, a paper was presented that was so revolutionary that members of the audience did not believe it could be true. One attendee, a respected marine biologist, stated the observation from the paper was, in fact, totally impossible. It was an observation made completely by mistake. In the late 1980s, two laboratory students collected a hydrozoan specimen that they believed to be Turritopsis nutricula, a tiny jellyfish less than a centimeter long. The individuals they collected were in their immature adult medusae form, meaning they were not sexually mature yet and unable to release eggs and sperm. They placed the specimens in a tank, hoping to breed them for research purposes, and forgot all about them. When they returned, they expected to find sexually mature adults. Instead, they found fewer adult medusas than when they started, and lots of babies, in the form of newly settled polyps on the bottom of the tank. Had these jellyfish reproduced that quickly? And if they did, what happened to all of the adults? To find out, the researchers started to keep a close watch on the individuals in the tank, and what they found shocked them. The adult medusae were not spawning and reproducing to create new baby polyps. They were themselves reverting back into their juvenile form, completely reversing the aging process. What they had collected was not Turritopsis nutricula, but a different jellyfish, Turritopsis dornii. One they realized is capable of Benjamin buttoning itself over and over again to the point where scientists learned they had discovered something inconceivable, immortality. In a world obsessed with aging and mortality, the media went crazy over this news. What is this tiny jellyfish's secret to eternal youth? Can it really live forever? And if it can, how might we be able to harness this age-reversing secret for ourselves? To understand how Turritopsis dornii achieves this amazing feat, it's useful to look at its normal life cycle. The immortal jellyfish is not a true jellyfish, but a hydrozoan that spends most of its life in its hydroid stage. But for our purposes, we will refer to it by its commonly used jellyfish name. The life cycle of this jellyfish starts when adult jellyfish, in their recognizable medusae form, swarm and release millions of eggs and sperm. Most species of jellyfish will swarm in the hundreds or even thousands for the purpose of reproducing. When a sperm successfully fertilizes an egg, the fertilized egg will grow into a planula, a tiny floating larva. Within a day or two, the planula will stick to a hard surface, like the seafloor, a rock, or a coral. Once stuck, they'll start the next phase. The secured planula starts growing up from its perch, forming a polyp. This looks a bit like a plant, a long stem with a bulbous head which now has a mouth and long, waving fingers. The polyp eats by sucking in food through its mouth, using its tentacles to help grab it. Now the polyps turn into a production line, creating a stack of cloned, nearly jellyfish. When the most mature clone is ready, it's released and floats off into the water as a tiny version of a jellyfish called an Ephyra. Now, alone in the ocean, all it has to do is eat and grow, and eventually turn into the medusa we all recognize. And that's the end of the line for most jellyfish. They stay as a medusa, swimming, eating, and spawning until they die. But Turritopsis dornii has a nifty hack for getting around the slight inconvenience of death. When this tiny jellyfish experiences high levels of stress, starvation, or physical damage, it can send all of its cells back into a younger state. The jellyfish shrinks and retracts its tentacles, and the medusa turns into a blobby structure called a cyst that settles onto the ocean floor, just like its past self. Within three days, the blobby cyst starts growing into a polyp, and the whole process starts over. Start to finish, it can all be done in about a week. It's like a butterfly turning back into a caterpillar, and if that caterpillar could then break apart into multiple butterflies. 
This amazing process has never actually been observed in the wild, only in the lab, but there's no reason to think it isn't going on throughout our oceans. So what is going on? How does an adult jelly turn back into a baby? The immortal jellyfish can do this amazing rejuvenation through a process called cellular transdifferentiation. This is when a cell of one type turns into an entirely different type of cell, directly, without turning into a neutral intermediate form first. Studies have shown that the medusa doesn't seem to contain stem cells, a type of cell that has the potential to be turned into any kind of cell, so it must be the case that its existing cells are repurposed. Scientists have found that the cells of the top layer of the dome shape of the medusa and the canal system, basically the jellyfish's digestive system, are the most likely to get turned into new cell types. Of course, the cells that make up the dome of a medusa are different than the cells that make up a polyp. They have different roles suited to different needs. It's through transdifferentiation that the immortal jellyfish can get these specialized medusa cells to turn into polyp cells. This reversal of development goes against common ideas about aging across the animal kingdom. It's long been believed that sexual maturation for any animal marks a point of no return, that cells are stuck doing what they will always do until they reach senescence, cell death. But the immortal jelly can turn cells back into their earlier state at any point in their life cycle, whether they're a newly produced medusa or an old timer on the verge of death. All that's needed is a bit of shock. And the first experiments proving this phenomenon, a pinch with some tweezers, was enough to get them to revert. We still don't know exactly how Turritopsis dornii does it, but scientists have had a closer look at the cells of the cyst form of the immortal jellyfish, and they found some interesting differences compared to its polyp state that could tell us how the immortal jellyfish prepares for its new life. While in its cyst form, Turritopsis dornii spends a good amount of its energy on internal upkeep, in particular, looking after its DNA. The jellyfish seems to be able to protect and repair its telomeres. Telomeres are strands of DNA found at the end of chromosomes. And a bit like the plastic bits on our shoelaces, they protect the rest of our DNA from damage, especially during cell replication. Every time a cell replicates, a little bit of DNA is lost from the telomeres, but because they are extremely long, there is a lot to lose before any of the important DNA is affected. But eventually, telomeres are ground down to nothing, and DNA is more prone to damage. This leads to cell death, and ultimately the death of an organism. This is what happens in humans. Telomere shortening, as it's known, is a key element of aging. But in Turritopsis dornii cysts, there seem to be a particularly high number of genes expressed that promote telomerase, an enzyme that repairs telomeres. With large amounts of this enzyme, the immortal jellyfish could be protecting the cells from naturally aging by simply elongating the telomeres and protecting the jellyfish's DNA. On top of this, when in its cyst stage, the jellyfish spends little effort on replication or cell differentiation. Which makes sense, it's actively trying to prevent cells from specializing. The cysts also don't respond to external stimuli, ensuring that they are focusing all of their energy on DNA repair and maintenance until it's ready to become a polyp once more. This has worked well for Turritopsis dornii, it's fast taking over the world's oceans. Originally from the Mediterranean, it's believed that they have hitchhiked on boats and are now found almost everywhere. Their resilience has probably helped contribute to their ability to survive across long distances and lots of environments. Researchers have found that in the lab, a single Turritopsis dornii is able to regenerate 10 times, at intervals as short as one month. In the wild, this could go on for much longer, possibly forever, in an eternal loop of back and forth transdifferentiations. It's unlikely that we'll ever be able to Benjamin Button ourselves. 
but there are things we can learn from this jellyfish that could help us stave off some of the diseases that plague us later in life. Transdifferentiation is an interesting field for scientists. Being able to turn one cell into another in few to no steps, and over a short period of time, could open the doors to treatments for things like Parkinson's. Imagine if we could turn skin cells into neuronal cells to replace lost or damaged cells in the brain. Understanding how the immortal jellyfish does this could help us work out how to do it ourselves. Another area that the immortal jelly could shed light on is microRNAs. These are short strands of genetic material that regulate our DNA. They can switch genes on and off and are involved in DNA repair. We know that a lot of DNA repair is happening in a regenerating Turritopsis dornii, and finding out more about how microRNAs act to regulate DNA repair in the little jellies could help us do the same for our own cells. Having said that, humans and jellyfish, while pretty similar in terms of their DNA when you consider how different we look, still split apart on the tree of life some time ago and there are genes in jellyfish that aren't expressed in humans and vice versa, so there may be some limitations to what is applicable. Even though Turritopsis dornii was first discovered in 1883, we only found out it might be immortal in the 1980s. And we're also learning that there may be other immortal creatures out there. The natural world, from organisms large and small, from jellies to trees to microbes to fungi, likely hold answers that we can't even conceive of right now. But as we discover more biodiversity, and as our scientific technology becomes increasingly sophisticated, we are likely to find out more, and it may mean new avenues for treatments for degenerative diseases and cancer. While the immortal jellyfish may not hold the answer to a never-ending life for us, it may at least give us a little longer. To fill our increasingly long lives, it's important to continuously fill our minds. And if you're like me, entertaining but educational documentaries are one of the best ways to fill both. YouTube can be a treasure trove of content, and finding a bingeable channel or series that is also educational is one of the greatest feelings. One of the worst feelings is when you're out of ideas of what to watch, especially when you have your lunch sitting in front of you and you can't eat it until you find something good. This happens to me when I've already seen nearly all the videos made by my favorite creators. If you've ever felt this lack of content-induced despair, now is the best time ever to sign up to Nebula, the streaming platform me and several other educational content creators made together which is a goldmine of new original content. To dive deep into history, the brand new series Battle of Britain, made by the team behind this channel and Real Engineering, is of such high quality I can't believe it's not made for TV. It's a series that will take you through the key moments of the first major military campaign fought entirely by air forces. The 3D animations are out of this world, and the storytelling will leave you captivated, all while learning about one of the most important moments in modern history. There are so many original series like this on Nebula, with more coming in all the time. And right now is the single best time to sign up. And with this subscription, you are also supporting us in the best way possible. Every sign up helps us to hire more animators, take on bigger projects, and keep the lights on and the machines running. So for something else to watch right now, you can watch our previous video about the incredible Harpy Eagle, or watch Real Engineering's latest video about the unusual fuel SpaceX is exploring for its upcoming missions.
Something strange has been happening in the waters around Spain and Portugal for the last three years. Orcas off the coast of Spain and Portugal have been body slamming boats, chewing off their rudders. Dozens damaged over the past couple of years. Raising questions about why the orcas are doing it. In April of 2023, the people aboard a catamaran near the Strait of Gibraltar suddenly felt that their boat had taken a hard hit from a wave. But this was no wave. They were under attack from orcas. In just 15 minutes, the pod ripped both rudders off the boat, forcing the vessel to limp back to shore, barely functioning. A month later, the sailing vessel Mustique was making a similar crossing, when for over an hour, orcas repeatedly struck the vessel, ripping the boat apart piece by piece. Everyone aboard had to be rescued, and the boat sank while it was being towed to shore. The orcas in this area are systematically attacking boats. Since May of 2020, there have been over 500 instances of orcas interacting with boats, sinking three of them and disabling many more around the Strait of Gibraltar, which connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea. And recently, it seems like the attacks might be spreading, with boaters much further north reporting attacks. It's exactly the kind of story that makes the perfect internet meme, whether it's indigenous creators making orca stickers with the slogan, be a problem money can't solve, or the orcas alongside a sickle and hammer proclaiming, eat the rich. It's clear that the orca attacks have ignited something in our moment. Feelings of frustration over wealth inequality and fears for the future of the planet due to climate change and human pollution. It's almost like we want to think that the orcas are taking revenge on humans for messing up their pristine waters. But can orcas actually do revenge? Some marine mammal researchers say this is just another case of anthropomorphizing. Maybe we're projecting because some of us feel like we, as a species, deserve it. Then again, orcas are incredibly intelligent and highly social creatures and we know that they can learn and respond to their environment. So maybe they are trying to send us a message. Back off, stop invading all of our habitats, clean up your act. But unless we manage to find a way to directly communicate with the killer whales, we'll never know for sure. But the deeper you dive into orca behavior, the more it becomes apparent that they deeply understand their environment and will take matters into their own fins if necessary. For the people whose boats have been attacked by the orcas, it's clear that the encounters can be incredibly scary. Just consider the size of the boats versus the size of the orcas. The researchers looking at these incidents say that the average boat that they're attacking is 12 meters long, while a full-grown orca can be over 9 meters long. Just imagine being out at sea, your vessel hit repeatedly by a huge creature with sharp teeth that's known for things like murdering sharks to eat their livers and beating baby seals to death. It's happened to sailors on racing vessels and even happened to one man multiple times on different boats since he works to transport vessels around to different locations. The orcas seem to be especially fond of attacking the rudders which work to steer the boats. This particular population of orcas doing the attacks is known as the Iberian subpopulation, and it had only 39 members based on a census from 2011, making them critically endangered. Orcas are incredibly unique in that their subpopulations around the world can behave in vastly different ways to one another, but we'll get more into that shortly. For this particular group, researchers know that they migrate based on the movement of their favorite prey, Atlantic bluefin tuna, and that means they're often in close contact with human fishers. But the area is also popular with sailboats because it's the entrance to the Mediterranean, so there are a lot of recreational vessels too. Researchers have even identified one adult female in particular who seems to be involved in a large number of the attacks. Her name is White Gladys, and scientists speculate that she may have been injured by fishing gear at some point, and her negative experiences are thus driving the attacks. 
Based on the scars on the whales of her pod, we know that some of them have had negative experiences with boats and nets. The other killer whales who repeatedly go after sailboats are juveniles, and some scientists think this might be an example of playful behavior or sensory stimulation. In different parts of the world, orcas are known to rub themselves on smooth pebbles near the shoreline, perhaps because they just enjoy the sensation. Maybe it simply feels great to rub up on a boat and rip it apart like a dog shreds a dog toy. Plus, orcas are also aggravated by boats in plenty of other parts of the world, but have yet to start an attack campaign anywhere outside of the North Atlantic. But it's not like it never happens elsewhere. There are a handful of accounts of orcas attacking small vessels over the past few decades, and even centuries. In 1972, a pod of orcas rammed a family sailboat called the Lucette around the Galapagos Islands, ultimately sinking it, though they didn't attack the life raft that the family escaped onto. But even further back in time is the story of the whale ship Essex, which was sunk by a sperm whale. When the crew escaped into a lifeboat, they were then attacked by an orca that nearly smashed that vessel to pieces. So what exactly is going on in the minds of these animals? There are a surprising number of similarities between orcas and humans. We're both apex predators and highly social mammals who have spread to all corners of our respective globes. For orcas, that means every single ocean and sea, and for humans, that means pretty much all terrestrial land masses. And both species have distinct cultural groups, or in the case of orcas, ecotypes. That means in different locations, matrilineal groups of orcas will behave in distinct ways, whether it's in the type of hunting they do or the foods that they eat. Take the example of the Pacific Northwest. There are multiple orca ecotypes in the region. Some eat mammals, while others eat fish, while others still hunt only in the deep sea. They also have their own distinctive calls, markings, body shapes, and other behaviors that can sometimes verge on the bizarre. In 1987, a female orca was spotted wearing a dead salmon around its nose. For whatever reason, the surrounding orcas decided that this was the look for the season, and multiple orcas from the trendsetters pod, plus others in the area, started sporting dead fish hats. The fad only lasted for that summer, but it clearly shows that there can be cultural sharing within and beyond orca pods. We also have a history going back decades of capturing orcas from the wild and bringing them into aquariums. And many times, they seem to form bonds with the humans, learning from them and from other captive orcas as if they were making their own new cultural practices. One example is when orcas captured near Iceland shared a pool with an orca who was captured off the coast of Washington state. When human performers worked with the orcas, they noted that the orcas seemed to have coordinated together for how to behave. Trainers also saw instances of dominant orcas receiving fish rewards from other members of the pod, though they didn't hear any vocalizations from the dominant orca, suggesting there was some kind of communication that happened earlier. And yet, some orcas also have exhibited aggression towards their trainers, from dragging them underwater to biting them hard enough to break the bone and sometimes killing them. These seem more like isolated incidents than patterns, but are these cases of the orcas fighting back against their captors? Were they doing something like what the wild orcas are doing off the coast of Spain, taking revenge? Whether or not we can say definitively if wild animals are motivated to take revenge on humans, it's clear that their attacks are becoming more and more frequent. Multiple studies have found that large carnivore attacks on humans are becoming more common, partly because humans are expanding into their territories, and partly because climate change is creating more resource scarcity and pushing animals beyond their normal ranges. These attacks come from all sorts of animals in many different climates. Polar bears, grizzly bears, sub-Saharan lions, and mountain lions. In these cases, experts don't think it's so much a case of animals taking revenge, it's more that they're encountering humans more frequently than they ever have in the past. 
While orcas are also large carnivores, they're not attacking the humans after they sink the boats. There have been no injuries so far, despite the number of vessels that have encountered these aggressive pods. Are their attacks just a side effect of human vessels coming into their territory more frequently than in the past? Or do they understand something about the fact that boats carry people and they're targeting our stuff, even if they're not targeting us? Unfortunately, there's no clear answer to this mystery. But there is more to the story of the relationship between humans and orcas beyond the recent attacks, beyond SeaWorld, Free Willy, or Blackfish. A story that took place in the early 1900s that further illustrates the minds of orcas, their capacity for friendship with humans, and what happens when they feel betrayed. The story of the orcas of Eden is fascinating and heart-wrenching and is about how orcas and humans worked together to hunt off the coast of Australia for many years. Never has there been such an example of orca-human cooperation before or since. What drives two apex predators from entirely different ecosystems to work together? This story of the orcas of Eden is so incredible that I made another full-length video about it that you can watch now on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform that we built for exactly this reason. To explore topics more deeply, sometimes in new formats, and sometimes within subject areas that don't exactly fit our main YouTube channel. This video about the Orcas of Eden mixes history with science, but it's a topic I simply could not resist making a video about. Nebula allows me to take risks like this and experiment more. Whether it's this historical orca video, or the Nebula original series I made called Becoming Human, about the incredible story of how we came to understand human evolution. Nebula is a place for all of its creators to make experimental and new content, like Joe Scott's Mysteries of the Human Body, which takes you through some of the most baffling diseases and epidemics from history or Wendover Productions' Extremities, which shows you why and how people live in Earth's most isolated and extreme settlements. Nebula has even produced a feature-length film called Night of the Coconut, and a genre-bending, award-winning play called The Prince, which you can watch in its entirety on Nebula. And now, if you sign up with the link below, subscribers also get access to classes. You can watch dozens of in-depth classes of creators teaching you how to create. So if you sign up using the link below, you can support this channel directly and get both Nebula and Nebula classes for 40% off the annual plan for just $30 for the entire year.